Israel is the only power that we have in Palestine. And that is why what we are saying is that we must start fighting for civic democracy. One person, one vote. And therefore we need to come up with a democratic alternative, a secular democratic alternative. And the only secular democratic alternative that I can think about is a secular democratic state. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, 67 years after the founding of the Israeli state, what Palestinians call the Nakba, or catastrophe, is there a path to a just peace? We talk to Israeli activist Ronnie Barkan and travel to Gaza for an exclusive interview with Professor Haida Eid from Al-Aqsa University. All that and a few words from me on Gaza's missing reconstruction. Stay tuned. In the last Israeli elections, Prime Minister Netanyahu raised alarms about Palestinian citizens voting and declared his opposition to a two-state solution. Now, the two-state solution has been declared dead too many times to count, but have we actually turned a corner? Ronnie Barkin is an Israeli activist, a conscientious objector, and co-founder of Boycott From Within, a group of conscientious Israelis who support the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, against today's State of Israel. He represented the Popular Struggle Coordination Committees at the European Parliament in Brussels, where he challenged EU institutional complicity in Israeli violations. Right now, on a brief trip to the United States, we're very happy to welcome Ronnie Barkin to the show. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, thank you for having me. So, very, very quickly, um, BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, what's it mean? The BDS campaign is a Palestinian-led campaign initiated in 2005. And what we call for are, is the implementation of three fundamental rights of the Palestinians, which are protected by international law and human rights conventions. And uh, until such a time that Israel abides by its obligations under international law, uh, we're calling on the international community to, uh, to apply pressure by means of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. Now, a lot of thing, a lot of criticisms have been hurled at the BDS movement, among others that it is anti-Semitic. So what's the significance of having an Israeli Jewish campaign that's part of it? So coming here as a privileged Israeli Jew, because I am the one who stands to gain, to benefit from the situation inside Israel-Palestine, which is highly unequal and privileges people like myself and denies the rights, the basic rights of the others. Uh, I can also say that uh, this is, the BDS campaign is clearly not anti-Semitic. Actually, we are opposed to all forms of racism, including anti uh, including anti-Semitism, of course, and including Zionism, which is another form of racism. Well, I was going to say, talk about that a little bit. So Zionism is a, is a, nas is a secular, nationalistic, even ultra-nationalistic movement uh, that uses, uses and abuses Judaism to gain legitimacy. Because inherently it is, it is basically about, uh, the, the Zionist idea was to establish a Jewish homeland somewhere in the world, but quite early on it transformed into establishing this homeland in Palestine, where there were actually people living there. But according to the Zionist model or the Zionist idea, it was um, as if there was a, a land without people for a people without land. So the people who arrived there, the newcomers to the land of Palestine, uh, when they arrived there and they saw that there were indigenous people living there, then obviously that didn't fit their model. So in that case, those people simply didn't belong there. They were some sort of an, for an alien, some sort of a, something to be dealt with, but not to, to accept and to try to establish some sort of a common life together. So quite early on, Zionism was not only um, a colonialist project that was supported by the European uh, powers, uh, which was about coming over to Palestine, taking the land, using and abusing the resources of the land, also the human resources, but it was also about that exclusive nature that that land belongs to us and only to us. And if you don't belong to our group, then you don't belong there at all. Two things quickly on the election. 
people have said for years that the Israeli state did not actually support a two-state solution. So to have Benjamin Netanyahu in his campaign for president come out and say that in fact he was never going to support a two-state solution and would not work for such a thing, a position he's kind of moving backwards from now, at least rhetorically, was to some people kind of a relief. Better that it be said and we move on. Was that your reaction? Absolutely. Uh, I think that some of us were quite concerned that uh, the so-called left wing in Israel, the liberal Zionists, would win the elections. Because I don't see... Uh, so you actually wanted Netanyahu to win? No, I, I have no uh, preference one way or another. I did not vote uh, for the Israeli parliament because this is an apartheid parliament and I don't see... I think it is illegitimate to the core. So I refused, I vehemently refused to boycott, I refused to, to vote for that parliament. What's the group? What do you do? And can we really bring about justice in Palestine through not eating Jaffa oranges? So not eating Jaffa oranges is part of it. Um, the group Boycott from Within, um, first of all, the name is a little misleading. So the long name, the less catchy name is Boycott, supporting the Palestinian biggest call from within. <laughs> so why do I mention that? Yeah. Because it is not about, uh, about us, the privileged, supporting, uh, coming up with our form of boycott. It is about us, the privileged, supporting the underprivileged in their struggle, in their just struggle. Uh, and the way to support it from within is not necessarily to boycott. I mean, we also uh, boycott as much as we can, but uh, we're not expected, under the BDS call, we're not expected not to go to university, for example. We also know that in the former case of apartheid in South Africa, um, including Nelson Mandela, people, uh, people went there to two apartheid uh, universities, uh, and, and it, is, it makes perfect sense. I mean, as taxpaying citizens and so on, we are not expected not to, not to participate and just live in a bubble. At the same time, uh, there are many other forms of boycott that, take, that, can, that can take place, and most of it is coming from the outside. So my role uh, coming from within is actually to give legitimacy to the BDS campaign and to urge more people from the outside to apply pressure on this criminal apartheid state. Um, as an individual, there is all sorts of things that I can do. And in general, the BDS campaign uh, it is a grassroots campaign where boycott is something that every one of us can do. And boycott can be academic and cultural and sports and financial, of course. I mean, please do not purchase Israeli uh, like agricultural produce and so on because most of it is actually grown literally uh, by drying up Palestinian wells, by taking literally taking water from Palestinian villages and in order to grow these avocados or whatever. But other than the boycott, there's also divestment, which is if any of us is invested in a certain pension fund, uh, students whose university is invested in certain companies that are acting in violation of international law or in supporting complicit in uh, human rights violations of Palestinians, then we ask people to divest, to pull out their money or ask their university to do so and invest in a socially responsible way. And finally, there's sanctions. Sanctions is something that it is not something that you and I can do, it is something that an international body can do, like the UN, and they should do. Since they are not doing what they are obligated to do, then it is up to us. So now I want you to talk to Americans. Um, you're not the only people with an occupation, Israelis. We have plenty of our own. The U.S. state seems to be acquiring more U.S. forces abroad. Our economy becomes increasingly dependent on the economics of occupation and war and policing the globe, as has been said. We, too, enter into a discourse of, well, how could we do this kindler, more kindly, more gently? Um, but that essential sense of the U.S. state as an exceptional state with special rules and special powers and special entitlements isn't eroded. And for many of us, it's easier not to get too involved. Life is hard. What's your advice to us? What can we learn from you about activism from within? I think that most Israelis are not... Um fanatics. They are just apathetic. They don't know and they don't want to know. They actively do not know. And in that sense, I think that that also applies to Americans. Well, uh, we're told they're all wars of, de wars of defense, but you're told that too. Yours is the Israeli yes, defense yes. force. Yes, Israelis are, you know, they, there is obligatory military service, but uh, uh, Israelis are determined that they are going into an army that is all about, it is a, you know, a defense force and uh, that they are actually 
protecting themselves by, by carrying out uh, Israeli aggression yeah, and, uh, and violations of human rights. And unfortunately, I think that uh, most uh, U.S. citizens think the same about the U.S. Army, but um, I see it as being very different. But I think it is very difficult to question the support of the troops here. We, let's end where we began. We started talking about economics and the economics of occupation. Have you got glimpses of what a new economy might look like where you are and, and how that might be created? We have to remember that the whole infrastructure in Israel is built around giving privileges to some and denying the rights of the others. And that includes the legal system, that includes the, the whole Israeli, of Israeli economy. The Israeli economy is geared towards war, it profits off war. Definitely those who are the weapons, the arms manufacturers and so on, uh, but not only them. There is a whole captive market, for example, in the West Bank for pharmaceuticals and other things that you know, they can only get their, their products from a certain brand or from a certain company. Um, and and we, have to, we have to remember that the whole of the economy is, is benefits from this oppression and peace does not seem beneficial to it. So we have to, there needs to be a very serious transformation and we have to, there has to be a very radical type of transformation in Israel in order to, to make it into a legitimate entity, in order to make it uh, respect equality, um, multiculturalism, rights of minorities and so on, and along with obviously having the economy not profit off the backs of other people but actually be something that is more um, sustainable and, and profiting for, profitable for everyone. Do you think we'll see it in our lifetime? I'm quite optimistic actually, uh, even though the situation is very difficult, uh, because there is a major shift happening recently in the past decade or so, pretty much since the BDS campaign started. So, for six decades, Israel was doing whatever it does with full impunity, coming both from the U.S. and the EU. Uh, but in the past decade, uh, everything is changing. The whole discourse is changing. Ten years ago, people would still talk about Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East, mm -hmm. even though it's not a democracy and never was one, not even to begin with. It was built on everything that's opposed to democratic values. And then later on, the discourse changed, and today, even in the White House, behind closed doors, we hear people like John Kerry questioning whether Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, we heard the recent statements coming from Obama against Netanyahu, which were, this is unheard of. I mean, it didn't happen in the past uh, decades, such harsh states, statements from the U.S. towards Israel. Um, and along with that, there is a public outcry, because I, we don't have to... Um, look up to the politicians or depend on the politicians to do uh, their role, we have to demand that of them. And uh, I'm happy to say that there is a public outcry taking place thanks to the BDS campaign that is able to galvanize people around uh, this rights-based approach. So we don't discuss whether we want one state or two states. We don't have a solution-based approach. That is secondary. What we have is a rights-based approach. We demand these three fundamental rights of Palestinians. Uh, and the way to implement it, that is secondary, we can, we're willing to, to discuss that. But these rights, equality for example, I'm not willing to concede for anything less mm -hmm. than equality. Mm -hmm. And how will equality for the Palestinians serve you? And that's my last question. I like, to say, I like to say that even if there were no Palestinians uh, in Israel, Palestine, I would still struggle uh, against supremacy and for equality. Ronnie Barkham, thank you so much. Thank you for coming and talking with us. Thank you. People can get more information. You can get more information at the boy about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign and boycott from within at our website. The borders around Gaza are rarely open. It's often called the world's largest prison, in fact. Those restrictions mean that voices from inside Gaza are almost never heard in the West. Today we present an exclusive interview with one of the intellectual leaders of Palestinian civil society, Professor Haida Eid. If you are born a Jewish mother in New York, Moscow, whatever, you have the right to get an Israeli citizenship upon your arrival at uh, 
a Bingonian airport. Whereas I, myself, who was born in Palestine, my parents were born in Palestine, my, grand, my great grandparents were in Palestine, do not have that right. Dr. Haidar Eid is a professor of postcolonial and postmodern literature at Al Aqsa University in Gaza. He received his PhD in English literature and philosophy from the University of Johannesburg. He is one of the intellectual leaders of the global movement for Palestinian liberation. The problem started with the signing of the Oslo Accords back in, in 1993, um, where uh, the late president, the late chairman of the Palestinian Authority and the PLO uh, started in a way actually fetishizing the idea of, you know, statehood you know, an independent Palestinian state. And now the, the, the Palestinian Authority is still in this process of fetishization of the idea of independence. Independence of what? The two-state solution is a racist solution. Two-state solution means apartheid, because that means an, a Palestinian independent state for Muslims and Christians, and an Israel as a Jewish state for Jews only. In other words, this is anachronistic. Historically speaking, this is a 19th century idea. Have, you know, nation states based on ethno-religious, exclusive ethno-religious identities. Israel is the only power that we have in Palestine. And that is why what we are saying is that we must start fighting for civic democracy. One person, one vote. And therefore, we need to come up with a democratic alternative, a secular democratic alternative. And the only secular democratic alternative that I can think about is a secular democratic state. I mean, that was the choice that South Africans, um, you know, opted for. That was the choice of North, you know, Northern Ireland. I mean, why when it comes to Palestinians, no, we need to, you know, to accept the fact, you know, Jews have historic ties. With, well, we have historic ties. I mean, it is, you know, the promised land will promise land for, for all of us. I think the essence of the Palestinian question is, you know, the right of return. And what we are talking about here, we're talking about the return of more than six million Palestinian refugees living in the diaspora, living, most of whom are living, you know, in, in, in miserable, miserable conditions. In the mid-80s, more than 75% of white South Africans voted for the apartheid system, right? And everybody was saying, I remember that very well, it is impossible for blacks and whites to live together in South Africa. The overwhelming majority of whites do not want to live with blacks. Reasons given, you know, because blacks are violent, because blacks are dirty, because blacks are animals, all right? But the same percentage, more than 75% of white South Africans voted for the end of apartheid in 1994. Now, doesn't that raise a question? It begs for a huge question. What was the reason? I would go back to the BDS campaign when every single white South African felt ostracized whenever visiting a foreign country. BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, is a Palestinian-led global movement to end international state and corporate support for the Israeli government. This is part of the promotion of civil resistance. This is what we, what we are doing, right? a kind of promotion of civil resistance. And civil resistance means a non-violent non non struggle against occupation. The more you oppress black South Africans, the more ostracized you become wherever you go. Nobody wanted to buy South African products. Nobody wanted to play soccer with, or rugby or cricket with uh, South African teams. Nobody wanted to to shake hands with white South Africans. And that is why in 1994, they, they understood that. Well, there got to be an end to this. When Israelis start feeling the same thing, Israel will be forced to look at the world and say, what do you exactly want? What I'm saying is that, no, you do not have two equal parties. I mean, Israel is a settler, colonialist, apartheid state, and it has to be recognized as such. And the two-state solution perpetuates that. We live in the 21st century. Northern Ireland, power-sharing government. South Africa, one person, one vote. Why not in Palestine? We need to turn the page. 
and start talking about serious issues. Not the two-state solution, not begging Israel to put an end to its settlement policy, not to big, you know, not begging Israel to stop expanding its settlements in those. No. Finished. I'm telling you, I don't want Israel actually to remove the settlements from the West Bank. That is too radical for me. Why? Because in a one state, in a secular democratic state, these settlements, or rather those settlements, will be used by both Palestinians and Israelis. Tel Aviv will be both for Israelis and Palestinians. The democratic alternative that we are suggesting is an alternative that should be supported by liberals and lefties. If you are a liberal, I don't think that you have a problem with secular democracy. I mean, in other words, it's civic democracy. That's what you have in the United States of America. Why should you have it in the United States of America? Why should you have it in South Africa? And we shouldn't have it in Palestine. I mean, if you are opposed to that, you are either an orientalist or racist. Unfortunately, the Palestinian leadership has failed its people. I think the Palestinian people are way ahead of their leadership. The Palestinian leadership, but the discourse I'm using with you right now is not part of the mainstream discourse in Palestine, unfortunately. Neither the leadership in uh, the official leadership in Ramallah nor the leadership in Gaza, unfortunately, understand the importance of international solidarity and the importance of the BDS campaign. We need a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift should be accompanied by a radical change in, in the leadership itself. Are we fighting for an independent Palestinian state or are we fighting for a flag and a national anthem? Unfortunately, what we have ended up with is a fight for a flag and a national anthem and we would call that an independent Palestinian state. Even if we are allowed to have an independent Palestinian state, that does not lead to peace with justice, that does not lead to comprehensive peace. A secular democratic state is pragmatic, practical, it is the only solution that can guarantee peace with justice, and because it is a principled solution. I mean, in principle, you need to allow more than 6 million Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and towns. And practically speaking, this is the only solution that uh, I, can think, I can think about. Our struggle is universalistic. It is untribalistic. So it is one person, one vote. It's a state for all of its citizens, regardless of sex, religion, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. To me, that is the minimum that, that, that we should be fighting for. That was Professor Haider Eid, filmed near his home in Gaza City. U.S. media coverage of the Middle East is awash in vagueness. I'm looking at two headlines this year. One, Palestinian said to be killed by Israeli soldiers, and another, Palestinian driver suspected of deliberately hitting a Jerusalem bus stop. On top of the vagueness, there's the imbalance. As the U.S. campaign to end the occupation reported this April, a single rocket from Gaza into Israel this year outweighed six Israeli incursions and 67 attacks on the Gaza Strip in the same three months. You could be forgiven for thinking it's by design that certain key facts get lost in the morass. But how about $5.4 billion? That's how much countries around the world pledged last year for what State Department officials described as, quote, life-saving humanitarian assistance to help meet emergency needs in Gaza after Israel's 50-day onslaught last summer. Between early at July and August 26 last year, the conflict killed more than 2,100 Palestinians, mostly civilians, and 73 Israelis, mostly soldiers, and left some 18,000 homes and vital infrastructure in ruins which is what the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA, says they are still ruins. Not a single home has been rebuilt, UNRWA spokesperson Chris Gunnis reported on April 23rd. To date, he said, the UN agency has received funding to reconstruct just 200 of the 9,000-plus houses that need to be rebuilt. Israel's ongoing economic siege, which keeps most building supplies out, doesn't help. Still, those billions could make a difference. In addressing donor nations last October, Ban Ki-moon, the UN General Secretary, called Gaza a tinderbox. Quote, people need to see results in their daily lives, he stressed. They haven't. 
budget crunchers love to crunch the numbers on government spending, how about crunching a bit on non-spending in Gaza before another hot summer starts? First, law professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. The exclusion of women and girls actually undermines the ability to see the structural dimension of the problem. Then we turn to the crisis facing elders. I'm angry because being a home health aide, you're not getting enough money. I think we should get paid at least $15 an hour, the cost of living. A relatively unknown story is captured in the film We Are Many. We talked to the filmmaker, Amir Amirani. There's been a sh structural shift in the public mm. against war. And Phyllis Bennis, author of, among other things, Challenging Empire. Democracy in this country is so flawed, so under the control of corporate interests and big money, that public opinion means very little these days. Mm. 